everyone, and welcome to lecture 12. We are going to be talking about international financial crises. So uh, we've seen that international trade and international finance are very closely linked. Um, flows, and goods, uh, flows of goods and services across countries are necessarily associated with flows of currency or other financial assets. Um, and trade balances fundamentally reflect cross-country lending and borrowing. Um, so, you know, trade is increasingly, you know, a feature of the global economy. The, you know, economy is increasingly global and financial markets are also increasingly global. Firms have customer bases, suppliers, and investors around the world. Governments are borrowing from their own citizens less and the rest of the world more. Um, and, you know, the relationships between financial institutions themselves are this increasingly complex global network. So today we're going to talk about the role of financial markets uh, internationally in general, um, and what are the implications of global finance for growth and stability. Um, then we're going to talk uh, just a little bit about the recent history of international financial crisis. So the fundamental purpose of the financial system, financial markets, is to allocate capital between borrowers and lenders. So borrowers uh, have some reason for uh, needing funds today. Um, they have projects that they would like to invest in, capital that they would like to purchase so they can produce tomorrow. Um, so they need extra funds today. Lenders have excess funds today. Um, so they have too much resources today and not enough tomorrow, and they'd like some way of transferring those resources from today to tomorrow. And the solution is to match lenders and borrowers. Um, so lenders can take some of their excess funds, lend them to the borrowers, uh, get back a little bit more tomorrow, so they've transferred their resources into the future, and borrowers um, now have the funds that they need today to you know, buy capital or invest in projects to produce things tomorrow. So this is a really important function. Um, you know, it's, it's one of the main ways that we have investment. Um, and, and, you know, because it's how we get investment, it's because, um, you know, it's very important for growth overall. And the globalization of financial markets on its face is, is a good thing, right? Because it's just deepening the pool of potential borrowers and lenders. So now lenders have access to not only all of the domestic borrowers, but all foreign borrowers, so they can diversify their lending portfolio. Um, you know, maybe they're getting a higher rate of return on investments in other countries, or maybe it's just valuable to have some investments domestically and some invest in investments in other countries. Um, so you're not exposed too much to you know domestic risk. Um, and for borrowers, there's just there's just more lenders that they have access to. So maybe you can't find funding on the domestic market, but on the international market, it's possible. So it's maybe more money overall um, for borrowers. Um, and, um, you know, it's just a different source. So maybe some borrowers that wouldn't be getting funding at all now, you know, have access to that. So this is particularly important for developing countries um, where there just may not be enough savings or um, you know, a robust enough domestic financial market to match savers to borrowers. So you know, there are ample investment opportunities in developing countries. You know, there are opportunities, you know, there's, there's plenty of need for capital accumulation or there are opportunities for you know, growth, big projects, et cetera. Um, and funding these projects often requires um, international lenders. Um, and, and so just, you know, broadly, um, there are three ways that these lenders can invest in foreign countries. Um, one is called foreign direct investment. So this is when a foreign lender has a controlling ownership stake in a company. So for example, if a Taiwanese company purchased a factory in South Carolina, that would be foreign direct investment. Um, and the key defining key, uh, thing here is that they have a controlling ownership stake. So they're making decisions about what, what happens at that firm or in that factory. The alternative to foreign direct investment is what's called foreign portfolio investment. So here, this is simply buying stocks or bonds or you know, putting um, deposits in a foreign bank. 
So if that Taiwanese company um, just purchased stocks in the company that uh, owns the factory in South Carolina, that would be an example of foreign portfolio investment. So they're still lending to this company and they're still giving them financial resources, um, but they don't have um, a controlling stake in that company. So they're not making management decisions. Uh, in addition, in addition uh, to foreign direct investment and foreign portfolio investment, um, they're simply loans. So foreign companies can go to a bank that is based in another country uh, or another financial institution, and they can just ask for a loan. So um, in, in the best of times, um, international borrowing is just a way to win, right? You know, savers in developed countries get a higher return on their savings because they can lend um, to uh, companies in developing countries. These might have higher risk or they might uh, just be, you know, more fruitful investments because um, there's a lot of growth opportunities there. So there's a higher return. And borrowers in developing countries can um, have the funds needed to pursue investment opportunities that they otherwise wouldn't. Um, foreign direct investment in particular is seen as especially beneficial for growth. So, you know, of all the types of foreign investment and foreign capital that are pursued, FDI is really seen as the most desirable. Countries really want to have it. Um, and the reason is because you have this direct involvement of foreign companies. So there could be transfers of knowledge or organizational capital or um, you know, it's just increasing ties to, um, you know, large foreign companies or exporters or something like that. So it's the idea is that it involves these, um, uh, these spillover effects that will contribute to growth uh, in ways other than the actual size of the investment. Um, so FDI has sort of historically been biased towards um, developed countries, um, high income countries. So, you know, the United States. Uh, in Western Europe, Canada, places like that. Um, but increasingly, FDI has been directed towards developing countries. So um, about half of all FDI flows since 2009 have been uh, in developing countries. So it's becoming increasingly uh, widespread and you know, a more important source of, or a more um, quantitatively important source of growth than in the past. Um, however, it is still small. Um, today, it's only about 20% of total foreign investment in developing countries. So foreign portfolio lend um, investment and um, just direct borrowing and lending are still more common. Um, historically, we can see that, you know, this, this is a little bit outdated, but, you know, we have the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s here. Um, the share of um, investment in developing countries uh, that is direct investment, portfolio investment, and loans. In the 80s, it was really just dominated by loans um, throughout, or sorry, in the 70s and early 80s. Throughout the 1980s, FDI is becoming more common and portfolio lending. So investments in stocks and bonds is growing. And by the 90s, portfolio lending um, is now the major component, uh, followed by loans and FDI. So, um, these trends have continued today. This is a little bit outdated, but uh, I, I don't think the numbers are too dissimilar. Um, but there's uh, more portfolio lending, more foreign direct investment, and less lending, uh, you know, direct lend. So, um, you know, loans and portfolio investment, uh, they still have the benefit of allowing firms to finance investment opportunities that would otherwise just, you know, not be funded, so they would be missed opportunities. The drawback of this is that, unlike foreign direct investment, you know, there's this connection to you know the physical assets or you know the companies there. You know, there's a, a controlling ownership stake, and so companies or investors are going to be a little bit slow to back off of that investment. You know, because if things start to go south, it's it's sort of within their power to try to turn them around. With FPI and loans, this isn't really the case. It's much easier uh, for investors to pull back, you know, to actually withdraw those funds. So this can be a source of volatility 
and it creates risk of credit crises. So um, credit crises is just going to be, you know, a credit crunch when, um, you know, all of a sudden loans dry up. Um, it's hard to get funding. Uh, loans that are out get um, called in. So, you know, oftentimes loans will have uh, terms where, you know, there's a certain amount that's, um, you know, the bank is allowed to ask to be paid early and that will happen. Um, firms that rely on reissuing bonds to, you know, refinance or roll over their debts won't be able to do that. Um, and, and so all of these firms are going to have um, trouble financing their day-to-day -day expenses, uh, trouble financing their investments, and that's not good news. And, and that's not good news anywhere. You know, financial crises or credit crises can happen in any country, you know, United States and um, Europe and other countries had a very big one um, in 2009, uh, it was 2008, sorry. Um, but for, develop, for developing countries um, and for international financial crises, there are exchange rate dynamics, which are all gonna compound this and make it that much uh, more worse. Um, and so now let's you know, sort of see how that works. Um, so, um, yeah, so international borrowing, um, it's a way of allowing developing countries to access investment funds in order to grow. But when they accrue eternal debts, external debts, um, this can be a big source of risk because, um, because of the particular dynamics that happen when you have a credit crisis in um, developing countries. So typically, a credit crisis is going to be brought on by a sudden fall in confidence that loans or other investments will be paid back. Um, so this leads to what is called a, a sudden stop. So this is going to be a rapid decrease in loans or other financial inflow. So just mechanically, this is going to have really big macroeconomic effects. So we can return to this um, equation from our national accounts, S minus I equals X minus M. So if borrowing is no longer possible, right? We've had a sudden stop, we've had a credit crunch, foreign lenders are pulling back uh, these loans and they're not issuing any new ones. And so borrowing is not gonna be possible. And you know, for a country that's accruing external debts, we know that they have been borrowing. They've been, rent they've been running a current account deficit, but they no longer can do that. So the current account has to rise because they can't borrow and they can't fund that current account deficit. <clears throat> so because the current account has to rise, we know that the other side of this equation also has to increase. So either savings has to go up or investment has to fall. And either way, this is gonna produce a fall in domestic demand. So if savings goes up, that means that consumption is going down necessarily, or um, investment is falling, that's also producing um, a drop in demand for goods and services. So um, we've had this credit crunch, borrowing is no longer possible. And to make up for that, there's gotta be some demand shortfall somewhere. So domestic demand has to fall. So this is gonna produce a recession. And um, this recession is going to lead to borrowers actually defaulting on their debts. So credit crises and sudden stops have this sort of self-fulfilling um, property. There was a sudden fall in confidence. You know, people thought that loans weren't going to be paid back. Uh, foreign firms weren't going to be defaulting. So they withdraw their funds early to try to get ahead of it, but this actually produces the crisis itself. So exchange rate dynamics can compound these effects. So first, um, let's think about a country that maintains a fixed exchange rate. So remember that a lot of developing countries actually have fixed exchange rates. Um, you know, and, and there's a few reasons for this. Um, it might be that, that if they didn't fix the exchange rate, it would just be, um, it would have enough volatility that would inhi it would inhibit um, their participation in global markets and limit their exports, imports. Um, and sometimes it's simply about maintaining financial stability. So um, 
So we've got a developing country that has a fixed exchange rate. So there's this sudden fall in confidence, foreign lending dries up, and um, that means that the central bank is going to have to intervene to maintain um, the exchange rate peg. And sorry, that's a typo here. That should say exchange rate. So there's less money coming in. Um, in other words, this is a, um, a fall in demand for the currency. So demand falls with this currency. Its price is going to fall, but we've got a fixed exchange rate we need to maintain. So the central bank has two options for this. It can either raise interest rates. So remember from the interest parity condition that if you raise interest rates, this is going to raise the current exchange rate. So that would, what, that would be one way of maintaining the peg. The problem with this is that raising interest rates is contractionary monetary policy. So this is gonna produce a domestic recession anyway. Um, it's actually gonna compound the effects of the credit crisis. The other option is they can purchase the domestic currency using their foreign currency holdings. So foreign demand for the domestic currency is falling. People are selling this currency that pushes down the price. But what the central bank can do is buy some of that currency to make up for that fall in demand. But if you're buying that currency, you have to purchase it with a foreign currency. So this is clearly more desirable. You're not, um, you're not adding to this domestic recession, but it's not always possible. Government might not always have enough foreign currency holdings to actually pursue this option. And, and so this, um, when it's not possible, this is what's called a balance of payments crisis. Um, so when the fixed exchange rate has to be abandoned because um, the central bank just doesn't have the funds it needs to maintain it um, through uh, foreign reserve transactions. Um, and so um, this can also have a sort of self-fulfilling nature. So um, in a balance of payments crisis, what happens is that investors will expect the fixed exchange rate to be abandoned. They'll look at this fixed exchange rate and they'll say, this doesn't really look sustainable. I don't think the central bank has enough funds to actually maintain this. Um, and so it's gonna have to be abandoned and the currency is going to have to depreciate. So expecting a future de depreciation is going to put further downward pressure on the currency. And that is again from the uh, interest parity condition. So investors are gonna pull out their funds from this currency, sell that currency um, in expectation of this future depreciation. That's gonna put more downward pressure on it um, and it'll exacerbate the sudden stop. And um, it means that the government will actually, you know, the foreign currency reserves that they need to actually maintain the peg actually increase. And so it makes it more likely that the fixed exchange rate will be abandoned. So um, this was the case for a fixed exchange rate, and it, it's, it just leads to a sort of undesirable scenario where um, if you can avoid the balance of payments crisis, um, you're in good shape, but that's not always possible, which means you're going to have to raise interest rates to uh, further reduce domestic demand. Um, and another you might say, well, what if we just let the currency depreciate, right? Like what's so bad, uh, you know, what's so important about keeping that fixed exchange rate peg? Um, so often this is what countries do. Some countries have floating exchange rates. Um, and so let's look at what happens when they have a credit crisis. So there's a sudden stop, foreign lending shrinks and the domestic currency just depreciates. So demand for the currency falls and its value goes down. So this has two effects. Uh, first, it reduces the real purchasing power of the country. So currency depreciates. That means their imports become more expensive. And so their real purchasing power goes down. Um, and and this, this is not good. You know, this can lead to real falls in standard of living. And often, you know, if the exchange rate movements are here and if imports are, um, important enough, um, you know, if there's no domestic substitutes, which is often the case with things like food or energy, um, this can lead to really high inflation. So this is 
not a good scenario. The other side of this is that their exports become cheaper to other countries. So you'll have this increase in export demand because from the perspective of other countries, well, your currency has gotten cheaper. That means that in real terms, the goods you're selling are cheaper. And so this, this will lead to an increase in export demand. And this can actually make up for the domestic demand shortfall and support a recovery from the downturn. So in some cases, exchange rate depreciations can actually be um, a strategy for getting out of this, um, this downturn. Um, and, and, you know, you have this balance between the cost of, you know, raising the price of your imports, which you don't want to do, but also lowering the price of your exports, which can be good for you. But another, um, another really important dynamic here that can really throw a wrench into things is when debts are denominated in the foreign currency. So when this is the case, exchange rate depreciations can be devastating. And here's why. Um, so first of all, why would you borrow in the foreign currency in the first place? Well, often foreign lenders are simply just unwilling to lend into the local currency. Um, if the exchange rate is especially volatile or if it's fixed at a rate that is seen as unsustainable, then there's exchange rate risk that lenders just aren't willing to incur. And so borrowing in foreign currency is just simply the price of doing business. You know, you have to do that to access the funds. And, and so, you know, in good times, that can be worth it but it creates this huge source of risk because if you're borrowing in a foreign currency, um, an exchange rate depreciation makes your debts larger. So if you have a credit crisis, all of a sudden it's harder to borrow and your existing debts become more valuable. So more hard, like more difficult to pay off. So let's look through just you know, a quick little numerical example here. So say we have a firm in Malaysia and they borrow um, 100 US dollars just to fund cost of goods sold. You know, they need to buy something so they can uh, you know, do some value added and sell it again. Uh, and at an exchange rate of 0.236, this costs them 424 ringgit. So they have a $100 debt and it's a US dollar debt. So they have to pay this back in, in US dollars. The firm's revenue in good times is 2,000 ringgit per year, which means that their debt as a percentage of their revenue is 21.2%. Then say Malaysia has a credit crisis, there's a demand shortfall and a currency depreciation. So those, have, those things happen at the same time. Revenue falls to 1,600 ringgit per year. So they have less sales. And the exchange rate depreciates 2.18. So now, they still need to pay back 100 US dollars, but those 100 US dollars cost them 555 ringgit. So their debt as a percentage of revenue has grown to 27.75%. So the exchange rate depreciation, because it comes at the same time as a demand shortfall, it's, it's compounding the burden of existing debts. And it's doing that at exactly the worst time, you know, when your revenue is falling. So this um, actually serves to increase net financial outflows. Um, so because the, you know, the value of your debts that you have to pay um, is growing, this is sort of compounding the, you know, the sudden stop and the size of the domestic shortfall. Um, or it, it's just leading to defaults. You know, this company might go under because their debt has just become too large in real terms for them. And both of these things would compound a crisis further. So, you know, this is kind of a, you know, it's, it's not a, um, it's not a good story, but oftentimes in, in economics, when we tell these not good stories, it's, you know, it's, it's just theory. But, you know, in this case, financial crises are really not uncommon uh, for developing countries. Um, and, and, you know, the international financial cycle is really what drives the business cycle for, um, for developing countries. So, you know, these are a major source of business cycle fluctuations. So we're just going to go through um, you know, really quickly, the history of the two major uh, international financial crises of the late 1990s, um, because they really, you know, follow this character very well. So the first one was the debt crisis of the 1980s. Um, it's also called the Latin American debt crisis of the 1980s, or sometimes the tequila crisis. Um, 
So what happened? Um, so the thing that triggered this was really uh, actually U.S. domestic macroeconomic policy. So in 1979, the United States had super high inflation, um, and the Federal Reserve decided to tame that, by sharply raising interest rates. <clears throat> so this produced um, a pretty strong recession um, in the in 1979 and the early 80s. Um, and so you beca because you have this fallen demand from the U.S., uh, this is a decline in export demand um, from the U.S. for its trading partners. And this was especially strong for Mexico, so major U.S. trading partner. On top of this, because um, interest rates increase, the dollar appreciates. Um, and both of these things contribute to a balance of payments crisis in Mexico in the early 1980s. So because they have this fall in export demand, there's this, um, you know, there's this recession in Mexico. Then at the same time, they have a fixed exchange rate and uh, it becomes hard to maintain against the dollar because the dollar has gotten a lot stronger because of the rise in US interest rates. So this brings on a balance of payments crisis. Um, investors expect the peso to undergo this depreciation because they think the fixed exchange rate is not sustainable and it has to be abandoned because Mexico will run out of reserves. This happens. Um, and uh, the crisis part really kicks in because it, um, the depreciation ends up being uh, much larger than Mexico uh, intended when they uh, have to move the fixed exchange rate. Um, and it, it leads to all of this, you know, sudden stop in credit crisis dynamics. So you have this big financial crisis in Mexico um, and investors sort of realize that, you know, okay, this is a thing now. We've got to worry about all these other countries who trade with the U.S. might be facing this fall in export demand and have fixed exchange rates that are going to be hard to maintain with the dollar. And now on top of that, there's, you know, you know, Mexico has this other domestic downturn and, you know, that might be affecting these other countries. So investors um, expect similar uh, exchange rate depreciations to happen in Argentina, Argentina Brazil, and Chile, um, all of whom have fixed exchange rates that are going to be hard to maintain. So they start withdrawing capital from these countries and that leads to a sudden stop. So you have this widespread regional downturn at this point um, and defaults on loans from private companies and governments that um, spreads throughout Latin America and, and eventually to other developing countries. So, um, so this was, I mean, this, you know, in the developing world, this was really a, you know, the big thing of the 1980s and it had these long lasting effects on um, uh, government finances, uh, and on um, growth trajectory. So it's something that, that did take a while to cover from. Um, the one group of developing countries that did uh, actually escape unscathed from the 1980s crisis was uh, East Asia. So countries like uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, uh, South Korea, Thailand, Malaysia. Um, throughout the 1980s and 90s, uh, they really had these you know, sustained boom. So um, very rapid growth um, that wasn't really affected um, by, um, by the 80s debt crisis. So it, they were growing very rapidly and it was, it was fueled by um, borrowing and current account deficits. So a lot of investment going on and a lot of it fueled by uh, foreign lending. In the late 1990s, um, there starts to be some skepticism or pessimism about future growth rates. So they'd been keeping up this growth for some time and people started seeing signs that this was not going to be the case. And some of these are justified, uh, some of them were not. I mean, it sort of depends on you know country by country case. Um, but the first place to really show the cracks here was Thailand. So Thailand did actually have a bit of a recession in 1997 um, and it looked like maybe they had had some uh, some overinvestment. So, you know, there were a lot of, you know, retail and, uh, uh, sorry, uh, resident um, real estate. 
and um, capital investments that looked like they weren't going to pay off. You know, there was a little bit too much optimism. Um, and so you had these debts that were going to default. This puts some downward pressure on the currency and they had a fixed exchange rate. Um, and so the same similar dynamics start showing up where investors expect this peg to be adjusted, the currency to be devalued, and they start um, selling uh, Thai currency. Um, so the Thai government attempts to head this off by doing a modest devaluation. So you know they just want to have a one-time shift of the peg. Um, but this sort of just it's it just sort of breaks the dam. So investors say, you know, okay, we're shifting the peg now, but we think we're going to do more of that. So it only sparks more capital flight. And a lot of the debts that Thailand had, um, you know, they had, it had accrued in these growth years to fund its investment were denominated in dollars. So you have this large, rapid um, depreciation of the currency against the dollar. And that leads to a lot of bankruptcy, bankruptcies because these debts get more valuable, so harder to pay. And it's at exactly the same time when you have a recession. So a demand shortfall and, and revenue is just drying up as well. So you have a crisis in Thailand. Um, and this spreads to uh, other countries in Southeast Asia. So the hardest hit were Malaysia, Indonesia, and South Korea. So all of these countries sort of had similar features. Um, they didn't initially have um, a recession to spark it like Thailand did, uh, but they did all have the same um, financial risk factors. So they had large dollar denominated debts and they had um, fixed exchange rates or I, I think um, South Korea might not have had a fixed exchange rate, but it was still the case that um, because they had these large dollar denominated debts an exchange rate depreciation was, would have been very difficult for them to, um, to actually deal with because it would have made those debts more valuable. So for these countries, um, they actually avoided exchange rate depreciations largely. Um, through a few things. One was, um, you know, there was lending from the IMF. So the government's got these loan packages from the IMF that allowed them to uh, have enough funds to maintain the currency peg. Um, those did come at a cost. You know, some of it was um, policy concessions. So, you know, reform packages. Um, some of it is just, you know, direct financial costs of borrowing. The other thing they did was that governments uh, increased interest rates. So this puts upward pressure on exchange rates. It heads off a depreciation by you know, just compensating investors more for holding that currency directly. But you know, again, the problem with this is that raising interest rates is contractionary monetary policy. So these places went through severe domestic recessions um, in order to prevent currency depreciations, which you know, in, all, in all fairness probably would have led to worse domestic recessions. So you're not really left with any good options there. Um, and so the East Asian financial crisis, it's, it's important for other reasons that we're unfortunately not going to be able to get into in this course. Um, it sort of led to a lot of the signs of um, um, cracks in both the international financial system and also, you know, the macroeconomic policy regime and monetary policy regime that we saw really come into play in the Great Recession. Um, so one of the big things here is that uh, in Japan in particular, uh, you know, they had a big recession at the time, you know, in the, in the late 80s and, and in the 90s. Um, and since then, they just had really persistently low interest rates, like close to zero. And monetary policy <clears throat> just really lost its kick because once you're at zero, you can't really do anything. And so um, this was sort of a big warning sign for developed countries that, um, you know, hey, if your interest rates get low, monetary policy is not going to work so well. So you're not going to be able to get out of bad recessions um, because that's exactly what happened to Japan in the 1990s. Um, and one of the lasting effects of the East Asian financial crisis was high savings rates in East Asia. <clears throat> um, so countries that were affected by this um, uh, developed a lot of risk aversion. So uh, the central banks started maintaining really high foreign currency reserves, and that's a form of government savings. 
and consumers actually uh, have really high savings rates uh, in East Asia since the financial crisis. And all of those savings had to go somewhere. They mostly went into US dollars. And what that did was that rose the demand for dollars, which pushed interest rates down. And so that sort of led to um, you know, the zero lower bound being binding in the US. And um, that led to you know, a lot of problems when we hit the Great Recession. So uh, anyway, I said we weren't going to get into it, but you know, the East Asian financial crisis really is like a, you know, kind of a watershed thing um, in um, modern macroeconomics. So it's very interesting, and and you know that of course, but we learn a lot from it. Okay, so to conclude, um, international financial markets are an important source of investment for developing countries. Um, so it's a way of accessing the funds they need to pursue growth opportunities. And foreign direct investment is seen as particularly beneficial for growth because it has this effect of increasing ties with foreign countries and um, you know, these things like knowledge transfers or you know, importing organizational capital that are gonna have spillover effects on growth. Um, however, foreign borrowing and especially um, you know, direct borrowing and portfolio investment come with risks. Sudden losses of confidence in exchange rates or increases in the perceived risk of default can lead to rapid withdrawals of lending, which is called a sudden stop. Um, just through you know, mechanic effects of national income accounting, um, this can lead to domestic recessions. Um, you know, there has to be a domestic demand shortfall to make up for the um, reduction in borrowing. And, um, in some cases, this can lead to a balance of payments crisis, which can compound those effects. This is particularly bad when, when debts are denominated in a foreign currency. Um, so here, the effects of capital flight and currency depreciation are compounded because debts that you have are, um, they increase in value. And uh, this makes them more difficult to pay, which can lead to uh, further demand shortfalls or uh, widespread defaults. Um, 